Okay, we are at the end, last session, and we have decided to make it about the power of story, narrative, um, arcs, archetypes. We're going to talk about things like Narnia, Hundred Cupboards, the Green Ember series, the Space Trilogy, Lord of the Rings, and the value that sort of thing brings into our homes. Why, though? Why do we have a whole session just about the importance of story and narrative? We've been talking a lot about marriage, about raising children, about education, worship in the household. <laughs> but when we look at all these things, they're, they're all part of a story. They are a narrative. Uh, and God has given an immense amount of leverage to storytelling. We see that humans have told stories forever and ever and ever. And much of the Bible itself is storytelling, right? These truths, the fact that God is alive, present, and working in mysterious ways in the world to accomplish things are stories, uh, and they're imp incredibly valuable things that we need to be have present in our home. So our text for this session is Psalm 78, verses 1 through 8. So we're going to walk through that, and then we'll dive into a few things, just like we did last session. So Psalm 78, uh, starting in verse 1. Give, o, give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments and that they should be, not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. I'm going to pray really quick. Father, thank you for this text. Thank you for, again, giving us your word, blessing uh, blessing us with it, for giving us many stories that are good stories that influence and guide our heart and teach us true things. I pray that you would give me a uh, blessing to handle this text well and that we would close our time here uh, in a way that glorifies you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Okay, so summary of the text. God explicitly cares about story. He explicitly cares about narrative arcs, about normal everyday faithfulness that creates wonderful deeds for him. Also about climatic events that happen in the course of history uh, that save people from certain destruction. He is the master storyteller, and much of his book is direct storytelling, right? Not only that, but he's called us to be like him, and this includes being storytellers in our homes. Right? So in this passage of text, the psalmist is trying to teach us something. He says, listen, uh, incline your ears to my teaching." His primary method of doing it, though, is a parable. Right? He says, I'm going to teach you in parables uh, using stories. His stories, though, aren't the prim, proper, disnified stories that we see being told to our children today in uh, typical media. They include what he says, dark sayings from of old. Things that are uncomfortable to talk about. Things like sin, depravity, wickedness, the reality of death. Uh, things that mankind does to other mankind. And these are stories that have been passed down from generations, right? Oh, things our fathers told us. Fathers should be telling stories. And we need to continue passing them down. We should not seek to hide history or how God's hand has been at work uh, from our children. We should be showing and revealing that through <coughs> the stories of Scripture and then the stories of our histories and the stories of our lives specifically. The focus of all of this, though, is God's glory, right? Again, going back to our catechism question, what is man's chief end? To glorify God and enjoy him forever. In the text, right, the focus is to show the glorious deeds of God, his might, the wonders he has done, not the might of man, not some romantic comedy, not some escapism from this world, but rather 
that in this world, there are wonderful things that happen because of God's work and for God's glory. He gave us a testimony uh, and a law. He gave us a story and a, a truth, right? Uh, both of which are command, we're commanded to teach our children, and often we use the story, the testimony, to teach the law to our children. And the point is to set our hope on God and nothing else. We don't want to forget his hand at work, and our hope should be settled on him. We don't want to forget what he has done. Because if we do, we grow hard-hearted like the previous generation. Right? We have a direct example in the psalm of what happens. So all story with no law leads to escapism and idolatry, but all law with no story leads to Phariseeism. So I want to start with a story. This is one of my favorite stories. This is a series called The Green Ember. There's four books. Uh, we've read them out loud a number of times, and we have audio books. The boys listened to them on the right here. We love them. Uh, just to show the power of story, right? So um, this is uh, it's a, like a Red Wall-esque story, right? Bunnies, birds, bad things, right? So in this book... Um, they're trying to get into the capital city of their kingdom that's been overrun and been sacked by the enemy. Um, and there's this big field that's been cut all the way around it so that the falcons can see anyone trying to get in. And so they need a distraction. And these other uh, rabbits are helping as the distraction while these two kind of commanders, leaders, uh, are trying to sneak into the city by gliding in. So I'm just going to read uh, a page or two really quick. Lord Hewson swallowed hard, keeping his eyes on the dropping rabbit. Engage, he cried. Engage it, you old fool. Then he saw Pickett swoop down and grab hold of Helmer, turning him upward in a deft dive and swoop. Helmer's glider engaged, and he swept upward in an uneasy arc. Hewson swept his glass to the left, where the distraction they had made was paying off. The sentinels swooped around the opposite side of the wall, and there was a busy hive of activity among the rubble. He saw the massive form of the white falcon glide in, screeching furiously as he came. Lord Falcowit was there, sweeping his glass back to the flying rabbits. They were actually flying through the air. He saw that Helmer's path would take him dangerously close to the wall. Pickett banked back and caught a current of air, so he swept around the edge of the wall while Helmer rose in a ragged passage. Hewson cringed and made every physical effort to will Helmer over the wall. The telling moment came as he soared near the lip. Hewson gasped as Helmer's glider dipped dangerously near the wall, but he rose again, clipping the brick and tumbling inside the wall. Pickett banked and glided easily over and both disappeared from sight. They're in, Hewson shouted, and the gathered rabbits gave an answering cry. Then Hewson turned back and braced for the wolf assault. Should we send a runner, my lord? Captain Redthaw asked, gasping as he gazed at the clearing smoke and the regrouping wolf pack surging forward again with savage energy. We have only three more blast arrows, and we need to get word to the princess they've made it in. And we don't seem likely to... He trailed off, gazing at the wolf pack. Send Emerson, Lord Hewson said. His family's had enough tragedy. Maybe he'll get through. Emerson, Captain Redthaw called as Lord Hewson shouted urgent instructions for the rest. Take a message to Harbone. Tell them they're inside the city. Sir, Emerson called, I want to fight here with you and Lord Hewson. Please, sir, send Harmon. He's twice as fast as me, and everyone knows. You'll both go, Captain Redthaw said, moving toward the bow striker. Go now, no argument. Harmon sagged, then nodded, saluted his captain, and tore off into the woods without a word. Emerson trotted after him, a last backward glance at his captain and lord. Tell them we died like heroes. Lord Hewson called. Then he drew his sword and pointed it at the advancing wolves. Tell them we did our duty. A shout from the defiant rabbits echoed through the forest. Let fly, Lord Hewson cried, as the operators released the last blast arrows to fly at the attacking pack. Tell them, he whispered, that we were brave. When we read stuff like that, it affects us, right? Now, obviously, I've read this book. I have a lot of backstory, and you can tell it affects me. I love this story. This is what stories do, right? Stories are soul food. Our souls need to be fed. Right? Just like our bodies are growing and needing sustenance, the same goes for our souls. 
Souls yearn for a worldview, a narrative, a way to understand what's going on around us, a way to categorize it. Like, how do I process this? What, what is happening? And the questions are typically answered through stories. They impress themselves on our imaginations. They, uh, the stories have been designed to sear into our memories. It's this very weird thing that God has done in us where stories oftentimes are more memorable to us than our own life events. For example, I hardly remember the details of my wedding day. It was a blur, right? There was a lot going on. Uh, I'm sure I could give you some things. Um, I remember getting there, and I remember leaving. <laughs> I remember saying vows. There was a kiss in there somewhere, right? Like, um, and I know those things because, well, they're stories that tell me how weddings go, and our wedding followed the story of a wedding. Um, but there was so much going on. But... I distinctly remember the details of the first time I read that hideous strength and Merlin was uncovered and Merlin came in. Not only that, I remember what was happening in my life when I read that thing. I remember the distinct path of road I was driving down. I can picture the mountains in my mind and the field and the windmills in the field in their exact locations, like vividly from the first time I read that story. Other examples of this, right? So. Uh, stories impress themselves upon us. They teach us good things. They teach us to love bravery, to love courage. Maybe some other examples of how stories inform our loves and hates would be uh, in Narnia. Uh, if you guys have read Narnia, the, the ride of Shasta, Bree, Erebus, and Huin to warn the Arkenlanders against Rabadash and his invaders. Right? They're riding against, uh, across the desert, trying to go faster and faster. They're exhausted. They've done so much. Um, and this story teaches us that pouring out ourselves for good things is <laughs> worthwhile. We are meant to be spent. Sacrificing ourselves for the protection of others is righteous and holy. Things to be desired after, right? Shasta dives off of Bree to protect Erebus from a lion. He throws himself to the whims of the lion to keep um, Erebus safe. They keep going when they're tired. Uh, they, they learn a hatred of selfishness. Um, at the end of the final battle, the further up and further in charge uh, teaches us to partake in the joy of God, to seek deeper and farther in, go after it, charge. Uh, if you've read the Wing Feather Saga, heard about it, we're reading that right now as a family, but um, there's a, a scene of betrayal, right? And we, we see what it does. I'm sure many of you could come call to mind stories of betrayal. What's that do? Well, it makes us hate betrayal because we see what happens. It makes us love Honesty, love, truth, uh, bravery, courage, what we just read, the Red Ball series, Brave Ollie Possum is a book we've read with the kids that helps deal with fear and cowardice and stepping up into bravery. Um, we have a song right now, songs as well as books, right? We're talking about stories. Songs tell stories as well. There's a song, my boys, I've, I've shown it to them once, and now it's their favorite song. The first time I showed it to them, they latched on, and I came from her, uh, home from work the next day, and it had been playing on repeat all day, <laughs> and they know the words. So I'm just going to read two, two of the verses. The second verse and the third verse says, this is a song called, I Want to Be in the Calvary. Uh, the second verse says, I want a horse in the volunteer force that's riding forth at dawn. Please save for me some gallantry that will echo when I'm gone. I beg of you, Sarge, let me lead the charge when the battle lines are drawn. Let me at least leave a good hoofbeat. They'll remember loud and long. I don't want to be in the back. I want to be in the front. Save something courageous for me to do. Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fight you to be the one in the front, to be courageous. Save some gallantry. And then the end of the song, let them play their flutes and stir up my boots and place them back to front. For I won't, be, I won't be back on the riderless black, and I'm finished in my hunt. I'm singing it in my head, which is why I'm stumbling over my words. <laughs> I want to be in the cavalry if I must go off to war. I want to be in the cavalry, but I won't ride home no more. Right? I'm going to protect, and it's likely going to cost me my life. But I'm excited. I'm ecstatic. I'm going to do it. And my six-year-old, my four-year-old, my eight-year-old love it. They're eating it up. Why? Because innately they know that that's good. And they're learning that it's good. And they're learning to step up. So those moments in their lives when they need to be courageous, they can think back to that story. Right? They could think back to Lord Hewson. They could think back to, let me lead the charge. I want to be out front. 
So our minds and souls latch on to the details of these stories, much more so than personal events in our lives. There are distinctions about stories, though, right? We have good stories and we have bad stories. Stories that are, uh, if, if they're food, like there are, we have a five-course meal, uh, and then we've got snack food. We've got nutritious delicacies, and then we've got stories that are uh, just fluff lined with a thin layer of cheese dust, right? Both of those are good things, but we don't want cheese dust all the time, right? I enjoy uh, Cheetos, I enjoy cheese puffs, but if that's all I ate, I would not be growing into a healthy state. So stories help inform those sorts of things. Uh, this is why education is very, very important. Uh, to add a little bit to Josh's comments on education, storytelling is part of why education is so important. Education done well oftentimes is, you, is, is using stories to teach points and principles, uh, which in turn teaches morals uh, and binds the hearts to those loves and hates like we just kind of were dealing with. Education fundamentally is a passing on of morals to the next generation, a passing on of worldview, a passing on of understanding. This is why there's no neutrality, right? There's a morality implicit, and why 2 plus 2 equals 4 is only understandable truly in a Christian worldview where there's consistency and reliability. And when you throw those things out, x and y can equal, x plus y can equal anything, right? We say x plus y equals male. But when you don't have an understanding, x plus y can equal a female. Or I don't know, it's whatever you want it to be. Right? This is a story, a narrative arc that our culture is currently telling. Uh, they're, they're trying to grab a hold of the dictionary, grab a hold of words, which are used to tell stories, to inform our loves and our hates, our understanding of the world. Now, in the psalm that we read, he talks about telling dark sayings of old. Right? You can't have true, noble things without dark things to contrast against. The realities of sin, the fall, wickedness, man left to his own devices helps us see what glory looks like. Right? I gave the example of my boys earlier that uh, like when we see uh, a, a child in the store who has not been disciplined well, it helps them see the value of discipline. I teach and train, but now we have a story to go to and say, look what an unloving father can do to a child. There's not peace, there's not growth, there's not life here. A brief aside, even law can be informed by story. Uh, and we see that in the text, right? We have a testimony and a law, and we're called to teach both of those things. If you look at Levitical law, it really is story-based law. It's called case law, right? And that's what our law system is based on as well. The stories teach morals. Morals inform a, a country's rights and wrongs, loves and hates. That's what law is. We're saying, hey, I hate this thing. Don't do it. I love this thing. We want more of it, right? So when we look at the Old Testament and read God's law, it really is story as well. Story informs so much. Uh, they also help us to see that the story that we are in, uh, one of the things that they do is they help us realize what's going on in the world and say, okay, Ecclesiastes teaches us that life is repetitive, right? There's nothing new under the sun. And so how do we take that into account? What's the story we're in? Who are we? And what's our character? Understanding our story matters because we're called to take dominion. And we have an enemy that's seeking to undo our dominion taking. He undercuts, he twists, uh, he relentlessly is working against us, but his tactics aren't new. They've all been seen before. So when we look back in time and see what's happened, we can then live in our story well uh, in a way that glorifies God. So an example of this would be the prophets. All right, let's look at the prophets. Typical story of the prophets is uh, they spoke for God. They were called, and then they spoke for God, and then the people hated them tried to kill them, rebelled against them, and then the prophet spoke again, judgment, because of the rebellion. The people hated them, tried to kill them. Sometimes they killed them. Sometimes God protected the prophet. This is just the repetitive cycle of prophets, right? So when we see a new man come on scene and he starts saying something biblical and he's calling people to repentance and then people start to slander him and uh, disparage him, which side of the story should we be on? Should we encourage the slander, encourage the disparagement? Or should we take what he's saying, stand it up against scripture and say, oh, that's true. We're going to step into this side of this story and encourage and help there. Another example of this may be in Bible, using narrative arcs to explain, in, in scriptures, using narrative arcs to explain something is meeting women at wells. 
women drawing water out of wells to support and sustain the men, and then men marrying said women, right? This is a constant repetitive thing we see over and over in the Old Testament. Isaac and Rebecca, right? Isaac goes to a well. Rebecca draws water for him. He then goes back with her. Uh, they're all excited, and then they get married. Jacob and Rachel, same thing. Uh, and then Moses and Zipporah, same thing. Right? So we see this repetitive thing. Something's going on. Uh, this is what happens. So what should we think is happening when Jesus meets a woman at a well and she draws water for him, or he asks her to draw water for him? This is why when the disciples came back, they were like, ah, what are you doing? Right? Like they understood the story they were in, and they're like, this, this is not what's happening. But what happened? Well, Jesus interacted with her and he says, I bring living water to you. And he tells her her life, and he calls her to repentance, and a bunch of people come. And these people who were not of the bride of Christ become the bride of Christ, right? They're converted. So the disciples and Christ are using narrative arcs that have been written throughout the Old Testament to inform the way we read and see the New Testament. Stories teach us the good characters and the bad characters, right? We want to be able to see who the honest hobbit is. Who's the conniving weasel? Who's the too friendly person who's likely going to betray us that we need to be skeptical about? How do you spot him? Who's the demanding dictator? Second Chronicles teaches us that there were men that uh, understood the times. We want to be like those men. Why? Well, because our task is to raise children. We've talked about that a lot here today. And it would be a tragedy to work a long, fruitful life, to raise children up in the Lord, to put the enemies of Christ under his footstool, and then to pass on that rich inheritance to children who have no clue what story they're living in, to give it all away. Stories matter. Stories matter significantly. They also teach us how to respond in our story, right? Uh, we see what's really happening, like I'm just talking about. Lewis does a really good example of this in the Narnia series, if you guys have read it. If you haven't, you need to. Um, in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, after the fawn, Tomnus is taken captive, the Pevensey children are kind of wandering around trying to figure out what to do, and they see this robin, and it's kind of bouncing around and trying to encourage them to follow it, and they have this discussion around, well, I'm pretty sure it wants us to follow it. Should we follow it? Uh, and um, Peter says, well, robins are good in all the stories. Well, of course we should follow it. He's been informed by the stories he's read about who's good and who's bad. They see the good character. This, uh, we see it again, kind of the inverse in the voyage of the Don Treader when we meet uh, Eustace Scrub. Uh, and we read that he has read all the wrong books. Right? He's read about imports and exports, uh, all of those sorts of things. And what's it do in that book? Well, it ultimately leads Eustace to not realizing he's stumbling into a dragon's lair, a serpent's den, a den of sin. He has no clue. He's walking into it willingly, Right? He was unfamiliar with the deep greed that dragons have over their horde and the, course, or the curse that is often found on dragon treasure. We see the same principle in The Hobbit with Thror and Thorin, right? Who, uh, they uh, contract dragon sickness because of the greed uh, imbued on the dragon sword. Right? So reading good stories help us see good characters and learn true things about the world, that money is a strong temptation that we could fall into. So thought experiment here. Let's just walk through this a little bit. Let's say a situation arises where a king says, I don't know, something like, no praying to any god but me for um, I don't know, some random amount of time, like 30 days or something like that, right? And if you disobey, we'll poke you in the eye or something. Ah, that's not strong enough. No, we'll throw you in a pit of lions. Yeah, let's do that. What should we do? What should we do? We should probably pray. We should probably worship God, right? Okay, another thought experiment. Let's say a situation arises where a ruler says, no worshiping God corporately for some random number. I don't know, 14 days to slow the curve or something like that. And if you disobey, we'll throw you in a pit. It's a, it's a horizontal pit with a bunch of bars around it, but it's a pit. <laughs> What should we do? Worship God, right? Worship God. He is a higher authority. Stories inform our lives. We just went through this, right? This is a real story, right? I've, COVID's been nuts. Our, com our country has gone on this radical power trip of authority 
testing to see what we're going to do, flexing their proverbial muscles, saying that non-essential things like church should shutter their doors and we should stay at home for your safety. Because God's not sovereign or anything like that, right? Read the stories and understand what's happening. This is what stories enable us to do. And when we read them rightly and we teach our children rightly, they can see that for what it is and they stand up and they do damage because they're sharpened arrows. All good stories have a dark night of the soul to some extent. Uh, some of them have multiple bouts of said suffering. Right? Again, uh, this applies to us. Maybe some examples would be the slog through Mordor without water. Right? They're just exhausted. It's a, at one point, Sam's got to carry Frodo on his back because they're so exhausted and beat down and dehydrated. We've got the disorienting trek through Mirkwood, right? where they're just literally walking through a forest. How hard could that be? But they get lost and they're disoriented and it's hard. And, uh, I think, in, in, again, we're going through um, Tolkien's works, the return to Hobbiton, if you haven't read the books, this, it, the return to Hobbiton to find that Sharky has taken it over after the destruction of the ring, after the return of the king. The work's been done. We did it. We won. And then you go home, and your home has been taken over by a dictator who is bitter and wicked. These moments are super valuable in stories because they teach us that suffering comes to heroes. Suffering is going to come in your life, right? And for many of us, we're in that long trek through Mordor. You have young children. We have young children. It's work. It's a lot of work. And it's hard work, and it wears us out. Uh, and we feel at the end of the day, we, will, we drop into bed very, very tired. But what comes after the suffering? Glory. Victory. Taking dominion. Right? So we're able to look at the trenches and say, ah, I know what's coming next. I'm looking forward to it. This also uh, comes into account when we understand what character we are in the story. Right? So who's the main character in your story? God, but you. Right? You're interacting with God. Who's the main character in your, your children's story? Them. Right? So what are you? You're a side character. You're a side character. Your job is to help them on their quest, right? And so you, what kind of side character am I? Am I a good side character or am I a bad side character? Am I encouraging them and uplifting them? Am I that dad that loses his temper easily and distracts from the quest? Am I that mom who doesn't really care about their state of being, doesn't want to deal with the things that are here and just, I am, I'm busy, go outside. What kind of side character are you? Ultimately, I think the, the, one of the big values of, of story is that it shows us that God is living and active. One of the lies that we are told is that we live in an impersonal, uncaring cosmos with no rhyme or reason, no direction, and our destiny is in our own hands. This is not true. There is a storyline being played out. God is at work, and it's happening according to his will. The reason it's important to tell our stories is because God saves us at the last minute oftentimes, right? God loves what's called you catastrophe. Catastrophe is on the edge of happening, and then God comes in and saves the day. And we see some wonderful examples in some of the stories I've mentioned, right? The right of the Rahirim and Gandalf coming to save the day at Helm's Deep. Like, they're on the verge. Uh, Aragorn is about to ride out to his death and kill as many orcs as he can. And then at the very last minute, we come in and save the day. This is what God does, right? He comes in and he saves the day at the very end. Jesus died. Satan is one. And then Jesus rises from the dead and defeats death and Satan, steals all his power, shackles him, and throws him out. It's phenomenal. So this is why we should tell our stories. I told my story a little bit earlier about my dad. God has given us stories to tell that show that God is living and active, right? That light switch moment for me was because I saw the story of God at work. And that God is real. He's here. And so really practically, what's this look like? Well, you should be celebrating things in your life that God has done, right? So we have uh, the great flood of 2020. We celebrate that in my house. When I woke up at 3 a.m. in my basement, I had two inches of water across the whole thing. We wake up. I've woken the kids up at 3 a.m., on December 18th of the following years to celebrate. Because in that event, God did some really, really cool things. Uh, and he blessed our family significantly through that. 
And so I'll wake the kids up and we'll celebrate. We'll have a cupcake or we'll do something like that. Birthdays, baptisms, like they're, they're, why do we celebrate those things? Well, it's because God's blessed us significantly, right? And so telling the story of their birth. How did you come here? What struggles did we go through? And then pointing to the glory of God and how he's blessed us. Baptism, same sort of thing, right? Like you are covenant children. You committed to the Lord. This is what happened on your baptism day. Let's show you pictures. Let's remind you of who you are and who God is. Uh, I uh, uh, skip that. <laughs> so uh, we're a little over. I'm going to get to my conclusion here. The conclusion is stories matter. They inform so much of your life. Be concerned about what stories you let into your home. There's a lot we can let in to ourselves and to our children, right? What are you consuming? What are you watching? What are you reading? To be really frank, social media is garbage. And you really probably have no reason to be on it. It's incredibly useless uh, for the most part. Uh, and uh, give, give your kids the gift of not having social media until they're adults. Don't allow that garbage in. What are the movies you're watching? What are the shows, the books you're reading, right? You should be reading the books you're giving to your kids and dealing with those things, understanding the stories, the narratives, the characters in them and discussing them. Great way to do this is to read out loud to your kids and then to talk about it, right? Don't just read the book, get through the chapter, close it and be like, okay, time to get ready for bed. Discuss what's happening. Who was that? What did he do? Why did he do that that way? Was that righteous? Was that wrong, right? How do we deal with this? Be concerned about those sorts of things. Praise God while you're doing those things. Psalm 48, I think Josh touched on that earlier. It says, walk around Zion, go around her, number her towers, consider well her ramparts, go through her citadels, that you may tell the next generation that this is God. Right? That citadel was made here. Look at that rampart. I remember this thing that happened on that rampart. Remember when we shot down the foe? Our God is forever and ever, and he will guide us forever and ever, and he uses stories to do it. Lord, thank you for the power of story. I pray that you would help us find good stories to tell. Uh, help us to tell them to our children and to our children's children, and help us listen to the stories of our fathers and our fathers' fathers. Help us to look to your word and see the narrative arcs that you have given us, to bless us in a way that we're able to understand the times uh, and be able to live dangerously, live uh, tactically for your glory. Thank you for the time we've had this weekend. Uh, I pray that you would turn a profit on uh, this work and this weekend a uh, hundredfold, Lord. We pray this in your name. Amen.